Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 614th New Social Environment. I'm Chloe, the Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Benny Maris and Ksenia M. Sobaliva. We're thrilled to welcome poet Peter Brzezinski here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions. The Brooklyn Rail would like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible and for their support of our growing archive. You can view today's event and our full archive on our YouTube channel. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest and host. Raised in Boise, Idaho, Benny Maris is a New York-based artist with an MFA from Glasgow School of Art. He was a member of the inaugural Paint School cohort run by Shen Dakin Projects in New York City. Maris has had solo exhibitions at Heroes Gallery NYC and Cleopatra's Brooklyn, among others. Maris has participated in numerous group exhibitions and has been an artist in residence at Casa de los Artistas in Costa Rica, the Bond Center, and Deniston Hill, among others. New York-based writer and art historian Ksenia M. Sobaliva specializes in queer art and culture. She holds a PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts, NYU, with a dissertation titled Fragments, Art, AIDS, and Lesbian Identity in the United States. Her writings have appeared in The Rail, Bomb Magazine, Hyperallergic, Art Agenda, and various exhibition catalogs. She is currently the Andrew W. Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow in Gender and LGBTQ Plus History at the New York Historical Society. And with that, it's my pleasure to pass it over to you, Ksenia. Thank you so much, Chloe. And thank you to everyone on the Brooklyn Rail. It's always a pleasure. Uh, and thank you to Benny for joining me today. I'm very excited for our conversation. Um, so, I'm sorry, I'm getting waiting room things. Um, Benny, congrats on the wonderful exhibition. You're currently at the space. Um, I think we can start with the slideshow so that people can see the installation views. And um, so the exhibition is titled Flash and it's a series of your work, another other um, that you've been working on since 2012. And it's exhibited alongside your heroes, which is the concept of Heroes Gallery, which I think is such a, such a terrific <laughs> initiative. Um, so let's start uh, with, Yes. So these are some installation shots. So Benny, tell me, how did you how did you first begin uh, with with the series Another Other? Yeah. Uh, great to great to be here with you, Ksenia. Um, my series Another Another started uh, ten years ago, actually. This summer, it's celebrating its tenth uh, year of activity. And it was, uh, I've been making abstract painting for 25 years now, 30 years. And the Another Another was born of a desire to uh, include physicality and action and being outdoors into my conception of abstraction and find another mode of abstraction that was very animated and incorporated my body and uh, being in the landscape, uh, which was something that in graduate school and up until that point, I'd always struggled with uh, the gulf between abstraction and the natural world. I feel like uh, a lot of our thinking about abstraction is about uh, the internal world of the mind and of, and of language. And I wanted to find a way to uh, break out of the inside of my head and into the world and, and find and activate abstraction in the world. Uh, so the, the, this really nice confluence of events led to the first uh, decision to start painting on my arm. Yeah, and actually, let me just, sorry, let me just clarify for our viewers that this series, 
another another which is kind of a tongue twister um maybe we can go to the individual shots of of, of benny's works just so that the viewers know uh what the series is and then the other artists that benny is in conversation with so essentially the series consists of benny photograph painting his forearm and then photographing it in various natural environments yes exactly uh, sorry, I didn't mention that first. No, 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 I should have mentioned it. <laughs> right. uh, so, so this uh, desire to start painting on my arm and, and then using the camera to record the activity, uh, it started in 2010. I was applying for a residency at the Banff Center in Alberta uh, to, to go spend the summer with a great writer and thinker named Jan Verfort who was inviting people, and there were 10 of us that were invited to spend the summer thinking about our relationship to nature. Like what, what do contemporary artists do with nature? What is nature? Where is it? And how do we uh, uh, collaborate with it in a way? And we were thinking about mimesis and sympathetic magic. So this imitation uh, as a way to activate a kind of underlying power in the landscape, uh, which is the synthetic magic is a type of imitative magic that is born. Uh, it's one of the earliest forms of magic where we're looking for likenesses in the landscape. Uh, so things that it's, it's actually where how medicine began. We look for things that look like parts of our body and utilize those uh, plants, minerals, uh, substances to, uh, you know, um, find potential heal remedies, healing. Uh, you could harm people with these things also. So there's this likeness in nature. And of course, a lot of many other animals utilize it as forms of camouflage and different other survival mechanisms. Uh, but that, uh, in that process of applying for that residency and starting to kind of think about these uh, qualities of thought and of activity, I had a broken arm uh, in, in my studio and I had this funny cast that had my hand in this really interesting position to heal the bones. And over the course of three or four months, the cast became totally covered in paint. And I was walking around every day in the city with a painting on my arm. And it was really fun to look at it in relationship to architecture and vegetation and just kind of think about it at home, lying in bed. And it was great to have this portable painting with me. And it, it, it kind of it reminded me of the very first painting class I ever took. My, I took a painting on the subway into school to, for a critique. And the teacher told me, you should never take a painting outside. It will pale in comparison to the real world. And that kind of set off a light bulb that, oh yes, I should be taking paintings outside. Like that's, you know, the wrong thing is often the right, very often the right thing. And this, uh, this fun time of having a painting on my arm, uh, kind of just the light bulb went off and I decided that I should be painting on my arm often. So I spent this summer in Banff painting on my arm and the, the speed and playfulness of the activity was incredible and so fun and so activating. And I found myself looking closer at, and, and, and all these different components of the landscape and trying to find different ways to interact with them and make different kinds of paintings that, that uh, had all these different kinds of relationship to the different terrain that I was in on any given day. And it, it, for the last 10 years, it's been a really nice, uh, I can shift between indoor and outdoor painting all the time, I, I maintain a studio practice and can uh, work at a different different speed and with different types of considerations in the studio than I have uh, when I'm painting on my arm, but they very much inform each other. Like the kinds of work and gestures and 
places that I see and, and discoveries made outdoors inform the paintings indoors and vice versa. So uh, it's been a very uh, fruitful and extremely portable, extremely fun uh, practice that has evolved. It's very suited, well suited for resident and for travel. I can take my studio with me wherever I go. And I've found ways to work in the water as well. So uh, that's a whole new, whole new world to explore. Uh, yes. And I want to talk about that as well. Um, and did you start titling um, the works another, another right away? Or is that a title that you gave in retroactively and what was that informed by was it the experience of seeing your arm in a cast that made it feel somehow other from you while at the same time being an extension of you and I think it's also interesting that you know the painting your your forearm it um it sort of negates certain markers of identity right such as race even though there are some some photographs where you actually see some of your skin as well Yes, uh, I'll start with the, the title itself. Uh, that's a great two-part question. Uh, I'm excited to uh, talk about that quality of erasure or blurring that happens as well. Uh, the title, Another Another, is a poetic chiasmus. As I've, uh, it's a poetic term that is, describes uh, a phrasing, it could be a sentence structure or even just two words next to each other uh, that are a, that have a strong likeness. I, I first heard the term uh, described by Timothy Morton, who's a writer who writes a lot about object-oriented ontology and the environment and has coined other terms like hyper objects to describe um, Phenomena. It's kind of a contemporary phenomenology. And he had a chapter in a book called The Strange Stranger. And he described the way that that chiasmus worked for him uh, to kind of, uh, when we putting two th ex almost exact things next to each other, it, it, it allows for a unique observation of the gulf between them. And, uh, it, and I love wordplay and I quickly started to jot down as many uh, chiasmuses as I could. And another, another was one I landed on on that first day when I first heard it. In fact, and in fact, I landed on that title before I went to Banff. So when I went to Banff to make these for the first time, I had the phrase another, another in my head. And, and over the 10 years, it's, it's only become more, it, it, it continues to kind of deepen and unfold in exciting ways. So I find it to be a really, uh, a really dynamic and useful uh, language structure to, to lean on. It, 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 it kind of, uh, it kind of speaks a little bit to that erasure and blurring you're talking about where uh, it, it, another kind of, uh, points to the multiplicity and repetition and manyness of, of the series. And another points at the specificity and uh, exactitude in them. So it, it, it kind of, uh, it just allows them to, to the series to grow and grow and grow while it has all this specificity. It can also just keep on repeating infinitely. Yeah, and it, it, it's interesting that my mind Keeps going, keeps going to another other, even it's, though I've seen the title of your exhibition, you know, and still I'm like, oh, it's another other. Yeah, it, uh, it's a it's a funny little tongue twister, and there is this otherness. Like I do, uh, I I like that it talks about how we, you know, our kind of Cartesian conception of the universe asks us to separate ourselves. The, from other things, but uh, I have a, you know, there's a burning desire not to separate oneself from other things, to, to interweave and integrate oneself. So I think it points at that 
conundrum that we're in of wanting to to be as close to nature as we can, but also uh, you know our conception of ourselves as humans can get in the way of the the sameness that we might be seeking. So it's a it's it, the title I think puts it right up at at that funny gulf that we that sometimes feels fall small and sometimes very wide. Mm -hmm. um, and then as, as for the erasure and blurring of, of qualities like uh, gender and race, I, I, I really love, love that that's incorporated into my mode, the mode of abstraction that I've, I've found here. Uh, it, it helped it, it allows me to uh, see myself uh, pull some of those screens away from how I read a body acting in the landscape. But even it, it, it includes the erasure of myself in these photographs. Um, I don't really see my own self. It's not a, it's not a selfie in, in, a, in, a, in a way of speaking. Uh, mm -hmm which is a question that gets asked sometimes. Um, yeah, yeah. But they're all taken on your iPhone, correct? Yeah, yeah, they've, I've made them on uh, my iPhone. Uh, when I started 10 years ago, it was an iPhone 3, so it was a pretty early uh, model, but the, the tool, it's really the perfect tool for the job. I, when I first began, I started making it on pretty fancy cameras and, and uh, thought that I should be trying to shoot it on, you know, the most high quality camera that I could. But the phone really, it takes, for one, it takes beautiful pictures. And it's, uh, it allows me to see the screen when I'm lining, you know, as I'm kind of lining up a shot, I'm bending into these funny pictures, funny shapes. And, uh, and you can activate the shutter with the side buttons, with the screen, you know, it's, it's a really dynamic tool. And also, uh, I don't conceive, I don't regard these as photographs, I regard these as paintings. So to have a, a big camera out, out there with me, the, the implement and the pressure to operate the camera well gets in the way. So with the phone, it's such a, banal everyday object that it, it I, I don't get hung up thinking too much about how it's operating it, it has a, a real speed and ease of use uh, that I uh, that I love and I, I I've still I still occasionally experiment with other cameras but it's really the perfect tool for the job and uh, and it, it enables a really ease of editing I can Look at the photos fast and share them easily, and and uh, yeah, it's, that's mm -hmm. the tool. It's so compelling to me that you consider these paintings um, because they exist in this realm between performance painting and photography, right? And for me, I tend to think of them as uh, performance, mm -hmm. and, and that has to do with. Um, exactly what you what you what you mentioned in, in in the press release for this show which is your ambivalence towards painting as 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 this as an object right and i think that we tend to connect painting to permanence um and so the fact that you make this painting and then you wipe it off is just you know it's just fantastic but how do you um, how do you navigate that space and, 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 and how do you feel about the fact that the painting only exists in the photograph, even though that is the primary medium that you consider this work to exist in? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I love the speed and play that this form allows allows for mm -hmm. and, and uh, the paintings depending on uh, 
how involved the painting is. It can take anywhere from 15 minutes to seven or eight hours to make a painting uh, on my arm. And of course, I can't help but have a little preciousness about the ones that I spend hours and hours working on. But, you know, there's only so much daylight in a day. And I, you know, I can't sleep with the thing on. So it, the, the full, it has a built-in clock and that cl clock, uh, it's fun. It's, it's a bit like surfing, you know, the waves get good. You got to go get them when they're good. And there's a, there's, uh, I, I, I love what that, what that means for painting. You know, I can, I can spend months or years working on a painting in my studio. But with this, there's just a, a, a kind of adrenalizing quality about the shortness of, of uh, how long it's going to exist for. The, tempor the temporariness of it uh, enables a kind of quick thinking and playful, uh, experimental. It encourages uh, a lot of exploration to try to discover new places, uh, catch certain vegetation while it's in bloom, catch the light from the right angles, just be to be at those special precise places at just the right time when the shadows are just so and the light is dancing across something just so. So the 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 just so quality of the of the arm painting is uh, it's very dynamic and uh, and and I, I really cherish it. So, and, and I do like I, the rubbing, just wiping it away and waiting till the next day to try it again. Yeah. Um, it takes, particular, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, it just takes a load off, you know, it's, uh, it's very fun. And I think particularly be because you work in abstraction, you know, there's such a history of being so precious about the surface and the paint and the permanence. Um, and I was going to ask you, actually, this one in particular is good to, to look at. Uh, do, you th do you think through the gestures, the hand gestures that you make? And how do you? Not, not really. You know, the, the hand, uh, it, it's, uh, it's like an, it, it's an I, I like thinking about it as an organ of the mind. It, it, it acts so fast, you know, you can yeah. like, it moves almost without any hesitation. Like you're the, to think you're going to move it is to move, it's hard to tell which is moving first, your brain or your hand. It's such a speedy organism, an organ. So it's so responsive that it can almost, that it's imitative power to, to do what you're seeing is really, really dynamic. Um, it's, it's, very different from the foot. You know, I've considered painting other parts of my body, but nothing is anywhere near the, as dynamic as the hand. It can, it can move in so many ways and has all the fingers to, uh, to kind of, uh, <laughs> to act with. So it's- Yeah, it's which, which has been connected to the superiority of the human, right? Like that's what makes us superior from animals. The fact that we can move our hand and especially our thumb in this way. And, you know, in, in art history, the hand has sort of functioned as this symbol of, of agency. And yeah. I'm thinking about Jesus in medieval, you know, manuscripts and the sort of gestures that he makes with his hands. Uh, but to me, this gesture here, for example, seems very intentional. Yeah, it's very, uh, very mimetic. It's doing, you know, the, I wanted to, at the very beginning of starting this work 10 years ago, I wanted to just do what the landscape was doing. So if it's a mountain, you know, kind of finding the way to do what the mountain is doing. If it's a plant, there's ways to, to kind of do what the plant is doing. And that very simple logic abides now. I can, I can just kind of take my, take my orders from, from what the nature is doing really and find a way to imitate and to harmonize with what's there. And just, you know, just stall, like the, the gesture 
is such a rich psychological tradition of gestalt psychology and the gesture of, um, you know, where do you start? Th throwing, gesture of catching, the gesture of writing, the gesture of imitation. Um, you know, some of these gestures, uh, there's gestures in ballet to indicate that you're about to begin a dance. There's dance, you know, dance itself is a, uh, is a, uh, like following what the people around you are doing is very harmonic with following the way the landscape is moving. So, uh, you know, you, the performance, I, I, we didn't talk much about per performance there, but I like that you regard these first as performance or that's what you see in them first. Cause well, I, uh, I'm maybe just my own personal shyness uh, I hesitate to call it performance and I don't do it for an audience per se. You know, I don't uh, always feel 100% ease doing this in front of other people. Although I do uh, more and more feel comfortable with it. There's constant performativity um, happening. So that's, uh, I do think it's, you know, kind of in, if I had to put an order of hierarchy to what they are in my mind, they're a, a painting and, and then they're a performance document and then it's a photograph. So it's all, it, yes and, it's certainly, yeah. certainly all three. Yes, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And to me, it's a performance document painting of the text. Awesome, I love that. Because I can't, I can't disconnect the image from the act, like knowing that you go to these places and the way in which you think about these works and the intervention into nature. And, um, and, and that's something that I would like to talk about as well, but maybe we can, uh, we can segue into your heroes and the exhibition uh, that is currently on view first. Yeah, that sounds so great. Uh, in, in fact, maybe we'll just pick up right there at the quality of performativity. Uh, and I, I, uh, I could start, I'll start with Joan Jonas in that regard. Uh, Joan Jonas is one of my heroes that's included in the exhibition. And uh, I'm, On View is the very first film that Joan made called Wind uh, that she made in 1968. And it was, uh, it was, uh, I think, six people total out on a frozen snowy beach on the North Fork of Long Island. And they didn't plan it, but they went out on the windiest, coldest day of the year and are getting absolutely battered by the wind to the point where the wind becomes a protagonist, a character in this film. And there's a combination of uh, choreographed movements and improvisational movements and some props. The characters are wearing these uh, hilarious uh, costumes with mirrors glued to them. So the mirrors are occasionally picking up uh, horizon lines and other characters nearby. And there was, uh, Joan has talked about a desire to animate her sculptures and paintings with the physicality and playfulness that she was seeing around her and desiring, you know, watch this as Fluxus was beginning to take shape in New York City and people were making art in the streets, taking mirrors outside and taking, taking sculptures outside, the, the body becomes, uh, becomes primary and the tool of the camera and especially access to moving image was this new frontier that allowed the work to be to be animated in 40 uh, time and space and this was Joan's first uh, first go at it and it's so inspiring to see somebody uh, so intelligent and so rigorous about 
about their artwork be able to play so <laughs> so vigorously and have so much fun making their work. So I've always, uh, that was, that's really why Joan is included here in this exhibition. Uh, just the ability to, to do rigorous play and to place yourself uh, in beautiful places and to illuminate the beauty of the natural world and build things to take out into and imagery that uh, incorporates itself and grafts itself onto and harmonizes and rhymes with the natural world and to perform, uh, to, to utilize her body as, as another prop, constantly as another prop and a, a generative tool, an art making tool uh, is, is extremely inspiring. Yeah. And I, I love the way in which you installed this in the gallery that it's like fully embedded into the wall. That mm. it's, it's like flat. So Joan was, was the first one that you knew you would include? Uh, you know, it kind of, it, it crystallized pretty fast. I would say the very first, uh, the very first hero that I knew I wanted to incorporate was Jacques Cousteau, uh, the, the underwater explorer. Uh, who's been somebody that I uh, have watched my entire life. Uh, his films and his series on, on PBS, spending you know, 30 plus years, him just going on adventures around the world and his boat, the Calypso, with his crew. And maintaining a, a vigorous uh, curiosity and desire to show the show this kind of secretive and, and difficult to access world in the most beautiful ways that he possibly could was, uh, you know, it, 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 it's so deeply ingrained in, in my spirit. And I wanted to find a way to, as I was, I, I spent much of COVID up in Vermont. And while I was up there, I learned that he had his formative underwater experiences in a lake called Harvey Lake in Northern Vermont, up on the, on the Connecticut, just off the Connecticut River near the, near the New Hampshire border. And he was there as a nine-year-old at a summer camp in 1919. And was, uh, his punishment for not getting into horseback riding was to clean the debris out of the swimming area in, on this lake and he fell in love with being down in the mud and the plants and the muck and uh, then I so I naturally wanted to go discover this lake and, and uh, make work there and in doing so I learned that 60 years later uh, one of his first uh, big conservation pledges was to purchase six acres of land that protected a stream that feeds into this lake and that stream has a smelt run annually that sustains a population of landlocked salmon, which is really rare in New England to have uh, landlocked salmon in lakes. And it was, it's there because Cousteau's uh, purchase of this land stopped a hydroelectric dam from being built, which, which would have uh, killed the salmon. So I just found that uh, so inspiring and such a, a direct action of how he, his desire to portray the beauty of the underwater world was his method of protecting the underwater world. Uh, of course, he was able to put his money where his mouth was, but he did spend 40 years trying to make the most beautiful imagery and films of, of the underwater world. And uh, another hero in the show who is a, a uh, engineer named Harold Edgerton worked for almost 40 years with Cousteau to develop all of the cameras that Cousteau used for his underwater photography, which up until that point had been quite, uh, you know, quite rudimentary. It was very difficult to make films underwater. And it was Edgerton's cameras that that really enabled Cousteau to make his films. But before Edgerton was working with Cousteau, 
he was uh, pioneering a type of photography called stroboscopic photography that uh, enabled uh, as many as 300 shots to be shot in, in 300 frames could be visible in one second of activity. So some of his earliest photography from the late 30s shows people making golf swings or people diving off diving boards or playing tennis. And it, in the photograph, you see all of the frames in one six succession. So it, it creates this really uncanny feeling of time dilation. Um, and for me, I had a really strong connection with it as an eight-year-old. I saw this imagery for the first time in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC. And I was learning how to play the, ga the game of golf at the time. And I saw one of these pictures of somebody making a golf swing and three, the 300 steps that it took all the way through the full arc of the swing and the follow through. And it was the most valuable learning tool I think I had ever landed upon. You know, you can get all the instruction you want and read the, read the steps, but somehow this ability to see the activity happening all in one fell swoop in one photograph unlocked some kind of potential to do that thing that I was seeing. And uh, every book and uh, exhibition, almost every one that uh, Edgerton ever did, he called Seeing the Unseen. And he had this desire to go beyond what the human eye to, could, could perceive and to uh, bring forth some of that mysterious, unseen, invisible quality of the world. And I think that that holds a, a, a lot of potential and really harmonizes beautifully with what Cousteau was trying to do, mm -hmm. uh, making the undersea world visible for the first time. Do you want to play the little video? Just to clarify, the, the slide that we were looking at before this was the Cousteau, and then what you see in the vitrine are, are the Edgertons. Um, and we have a little video. And actually, I hadn't thought about this before, but the, his famous photograph of the, of the milk splash, the milk yes. drop splashing, it sort of mimics your the photograph that's hanging next to the Cousteau, the gesture that you're making. Yes, <laughs> it's a, there's a really nice correspondence there. Was that intentional or no? Uh, it was a, that's a happy accident, <laughs> a very happy accident. Yeah. So <laughs> these are the Edgertons, um, and uh, I was actually at somebody's house yesterday, and they had an Edgerton. Wow. I have to text. I have to text you that. Oh, yeah. which, one, which one was it? I, I it's uh, actually I think it's the one with the rackets. It's either rackets or chairs. Oh. Uh, but Oops. yeah, I mean, there's this fascination with with speed as well, and um, and a certain lightness, which which we talked about. Uh, you loving that text by Italo Calvino. Yes. It's like uh, through the new millennium. Yeah, that Italo Calvino text is uh, just endlessly rich. It's been following me around for uh, 15 years now. Uh, it was a book that he wrote uh, about literary values that might be passed along to the next generation. If he could pass six along, uh, he would pass along the values of lightness, quickness, exactitude, multiplicity, and repetition. Uh, and he, and these, uh, or excuse me, visibility, not repetition. I think repetition falls into multiplicity. But uh, yeah, I think uh, the lightness, quickness, exactitude, visibility, and multiplicity, I think they really, uh, Edgerton's work touches each of those uh, evenly and so articulately. Mm -hmm. And also, the, I, I think what, um, you know, across, Joan Jonas and Cousteau and and Edgerton, and there is um, there's an interest in the elements, right? 
which you share, particularly water and air, um, but then also this element of, ch of chance. Yeah, yeah, that uh, element of unpredictability where the weather becomes a character, the wind, the rain, the, the waves in the ocean, uh, it's so exciting and vital and dynamic to the work to have it uh, be able to be derailed or enhanced or it's, uh, it's like dancing, like we were talking about earlier, you get to respond very quickly to what's happening around you. And, and that's a, a critical part of this series of work that I'm working on. And in fact, uh, I was listening to Joan Jonas talk about this, uh, this film in one of her, she was kind of, uh, it was a longer lecture, it's available on YouTube. She was talking about the experience of seeing dolphins in Greece on a residency on Mycenaean pottery, and then eventually seeing them in the ocean and, because, and as, as a swimmer herself, eventually getting to swim and, and be with dolphins and the quality of play of the, uh, the dolphin was something she actively desired in her work and led her to, to make this film. So there is, and, and Cousteau placed the highest uh, value on dolphins. He regarded them as uh, our counterpart, human's counterpart in the ocean. Mm. And that we share an eye and that our, our futures are very much intertwined with one another. Were there dolphins, there's sharks. Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can we go to the Yusuf Latif? Because I think um, I tend to consider the Joan Jonas, Cousteau, uh, Edgerton, and Latif together, mm -hmm. and then the Pucci and the uh, Smokehouse as separate. And I think it it has to do with those with with the, with water, air, chance. Uh, the others for me are somehow more static and uh, Smokehouse in particular speaks to the social political potential of abstraction, yes. which why why I think you probably included them. Um, and Pucci invented spandex. Yeah, he, he so there's a connection to water there. He pioneered stretch stretch fabrics. He yeah. was a, uh, he was a professional skier himself and wanted to look beautiful and ski well. And so he needed his fabric to move with him. And, and so the, at the beginning of his design career, it was uh, kind of more a matter of functionality uh, to enable a certain kind of movement. And then once the fabric had been developed, then he really let it rip aesthetically and tried to incorporate this really maximal visual approach to the patterns he was designing. And he was working closely with chemists. He designed over 400 pigments to include in his work as well. So he was, he was as interested in how things looked as how they functioned. Mm -hmm. First came the function, mm -hmm. and then the form, form followed. And his form for the first kind of 20 years or so seemed to be really informed by his travels. He would work with motifs from wherever he was traveling, uh, spent a lot in Southeast Asia, a lot in Africa, and he was bringing, bringing those types of form, appropriating those types of forms into his patterns. And then as the kind of psychedelic era was dawning in the mid 60s, he really started to kind of find his own visual language that, uh, that you, you know, some of it, like this, uh, the image that we're looking at of this scarf that's in the exhibition still has some of this classical architecture in it. You can see the header and the pillars that kind of form a, almost like a post and lintel structure, like a doorway or, or, or a portal and, and have some uh, relationship to ratios like the golden ratio or the Fibonacci kind of, uh, proportions that architects value, but then this just dazzling, swirling, flowing motion. 
And he was also a fighter pilot. So he incorporated uh, his experience of speed and being airborne into the work. So uh, I am also, a, I was a competitive skier for many, many years doing aerials. And my father was a fighter pilot. So I have a strong affinity for where this uh, aesthetic uh, look comes from and can, can really grab onto the joyful, maximal abundance of it. And then also the, the roots of uh, being in the air and, and liking to go fast. Yeah, I love how these are all, I love all these connections that you're making that I would never, you know, have walking into the exhibition and not having spoken to you, uh, mm -hmm. I would never have made. And there is so much, it sounds like there's so much research involved as well. Um, is that something that has always been a part of your practice or is it this project in particular that triggered it? Uh, it's a, a bit of both, but, but uh, this, the Heroes Gallery concept is really incredible. I got to kind of take a curatorial approach to, my, to making this exhibition and uh, working closely with, with my partner, Alina Katzoff, and with, uh, you know, just a kind of wealth of, to, to get to do this research in the service of my own work and to be able to choose my dream team of people who have, uh, whose influences and inspirations have been close with me, some of them since childhood, was very inform really informative. I, I feel like I really learned a lot about my own work by doing this research. So it was, it was very generative. And uh, I got to, I, I traveled some for the research, you know, for, for the inclusion of Cousteau. I traveled uh, not only to the lake and the creek that he conserved, but also went to the, to the archive of the Green River, or excuse me, the Connecticut River Conservancy to look through their archives and find out uh, to look for traces of Cousteau's involvement and the records of that interaction. With Pucci, I was in touch with the estate and got to work closely with Pucci's, uh, Pucci's daughter and the archivist there, Dylan Colucci, who helped me uh, look through all different kinds of incredible Pucci memorabilia and artifacts and, and try to find something that really spoke to the to the work I was making, but also discover new things about how Pucci was making his work. Uh, I got to collaborate uh, with the uh, with uh, the archive or the Smokehouse Associates at Michael Rosenfeld Gallery. I got to look through uh, the record of their work, and, and uh, it was very exciting. I, I had first seen that Smokehouse work at a, at the Harlem the Studio Museum of Harlem. And uh, Eric, a curator named Eric Booker curated an exhibition, uh, which was a slide carousel showing these photographs. And it was really beautiful to see them in their in, at the technology that would have in the technology that would have been available at the time. Uh, and he's producing a, a book of that work coming out this fall. So that's a very exciting uh, development and nice to participate in this. The ongoing interest in in Smokehouse Associates and what they were doing, uh, like you said, and that's uh, to, I guess transition to Smokehouse. They uh, they were painting abstract murals on tenement buildings in Harlem in 1969 and 1970, and had this. They were devoted to using their own tools and their own implements that they were building. So they were kind of testing at the potential for abstraction in, a, in with architecture and in, a, in the outdoor urban environment, but also with this really sensitive relationship to their own bodies. So a lot of the forms have a wingspan kind of size to them and, and have this relationship to the body and to their ladders and to their implements that they were using. That feels like something that they were, it feels a little bit like testing, you know, the way I kind of utilize my arm. I'm trying to find those kinds of sensitivities and have this ongoing relationship to scale and my size and 
sometimes distorting the scale and sometimes uh, uh, just finding, finding a, the shape of myself to be really amorphous once I get, once I'm outdoors and measuring it against other things. So uh, their work had this really utopian and transformative potential and capacity to it where they were allowing everything, the life of the city became the kind of subject of the painting. So everything that's happening around it becomes the subject and is in interwoven or the painting is interwoven into everything that's happening around it. And you've exhibited some archival material that uh, documents. Exactly, yeah, there are three photographs of, of uh, them in action. And all three of the photographs have, uh, they, they are painting in the photographs. So the, the painter painting and seeing the, seeing the action, seeing the physicality of what they were doing is, is uh, a really uh, exciting and informative part of, of why I chose the three photographs that I did. Uh, but their work is, is so beautiful and, and was, uh, they would start their paintings with no plan. They were very, responsive to uh, what was in the immediate surroundings, whether it was things they were seeing in storefronts nearby or the ways shadows were moving across architecture at different times of the day would, would kind of uh, steer the way they would make the painting, as well as conversations with people in the neighborhood. So they had this really generative uh, idea and, and just were almost testing out uh, the, to see what, you know, if the abstraction is the method and hope is the message, it had this real um, hope, up, uplifting, hopeful desire to it and, beautif and beautifying quality to it. And so the, your process of selecting the works by your heroes um, sounds like it was a combination of, of knowing a particular one that you wanted like Joan Jonas's Wind and then others like this archival material or the Pucci sort of you arrive at through the process of research and and visiting etc so so there's an element of chance there as well definitely definitely uh I wanted to have a as opposed to choosing just one hero I wanted a real conversational approach so that the, the work of the heroes would be equal, vo equal vocal or equal voices in the room and would generate interactivities and resonances with each other as well. Um, Youssef Latif is a, is a musician and, and maybe one of the deepest resonators I could possibly imagine. Uh, he was a tenor saxophone player who made drawings and paintings his whole life that he, especially later in his life, that he regarded as abstract scores. And he began this process uh, with John Coltrane. And they were kind of making some really simple geometric abstractions that they would then kind of a work out a methodology for how to play it and how to kind of make an abstract musical language. And Youssef would continue that for his life and really develop a very singular visual language that uh, it, his work is right next to Joan Jonas's in the exhibition. And Joan's film is called Wind and Youssef would often begin his drawings utilizing his wind. He would puddle ink on the, on the paper and blow it around and it would, it would uh, find its form and then he would accentuate that form and extrapolate it to, into these plant-like shapes and organistic shapes and and uh, and then they were they had the potential to be played as a, as a musical score and and he developed a, a a method of making music that he called auto physio psychic music um, he rejected the word jazz because of its racist connotations and assumptions and he called his music auto physio psychic to uh, suggest the interweaving of mind, body, and spirit into the making of it. It had a very improvisational approach, almost like a, 
almost like a Quaker meeting where you, you could sit with a group of musicians and if one person is moved to, to speak or to make sound, that's the, that begins a, a, a time of call and response or of harmonization or of imitation and, and uh, it just a kind of self-generating music that was very, very rigorous. He was very disciplined and played 14 hours a day often, but would make spontaneous music. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I loved the, the connection between a, an aesthetic sense of system and, and a painting and, and of sound. I think they're really innately connected. And I think Yusef is, is so artic effortlessly articulate about how the two inform, inform each other. And were there were there others that you wanted to include, or is this? Uh, this was one that. I, How about Ligia Clark? Oh, Ligia Clark, of course. <laughs> uh, Ligia, her uh, the the arc of her career is in, is incredible. The transition, the the complete dematerialization of the object over 50 years is something that I find so intriguing and beautiful and inspiring. And, uh, you know, her, her move from geometric abstraction and painting and drawing into these uh, sculptural forms and cut paper forms that, that she would describe as the, the cuts the, the gaps became the three-dimensional quality. So to have this conception of the cutting or the removal of something as the three, the thing that gave it body, I think is, was a really profoundly strange and paradoxical but intriguing uh, idea that she would go on to uh, kind of Make her sculpt, make these sculptures that required people interacting with each other and with the object to activate. And she would call the medium the interaction, you know, the 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 cooperation and experimentation and physicality of the people became the medium that she was working in. And and she would go on to, you know, her it would eventually kind of become therapy over the course of, of 50 years. That, that utilization of, of bodies and people and psychology as, as the medium, uh, she just kept, it was an incredible evolution and endlessly inspiring and, and shows just a, a, an extraordinary potentiality for where abstraction can take someone. Benny, you've, you've staged such a multi-layered conversation across abstraction and chance and ephemerality and the elements and photography and performance. Um, and I want to I wanna end by returning to your work. Actually, um, I remember first seeing your work on your phone. You showed me images. Mm -hmm. and it was, you know, it was kind of a a breath of fresh air because it wasn't uh there is a certain when you first see it there is a certain lightheartedness to it right there is a certain joie de vivre right it's a, a joyful existence in nature uh but i think that as i you know gotten gotten to know it more um it's it has it has become, there is a dark layer behind it, which has to do with obviously the environment and climate change and the global crisis that we're in. And it almost becomes a vanitas to mm. nature, of nature, right? Like these beautiful landscapes that we're seeing are actually being destroyed and our hand is what is doing it yes 
Do you have thoughts on that? That's uh, that's a beautiful insight, and uh, that is exactly the. I think you've articulated the 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 dark side of it uh, in a way really really beautifully there. Um, it 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 uh, you know as Cousteau would would kind of idealistically imagine that to be able to portray something really beautifully is to protect it. You know, I, I, I maintain that hope that to interact with and to celebrate and immerse myself in the natural world might hold out the potential to, to protect it. I, uh, I do uh, fear for it and, and fret and, uh, cower at the destruction that's we're you know we're all witnessing uh and do feel some kind of a you know there's a a press like there i do want to get there there's a bearing witness i guess that's the we're all bearing witness in our own way or trying to find a way to bear witness to the devastation that we're seeing. And it's not ever easy. And to do it uh, with this kind of joyful face and, and easy breeze does, you know, I, I would worry that I'm, I'm not trying to breeze over the reality, um, but we have to fa all find ways to bear witness to it differently and to survive it and to keep finding joy and, and laughter and levity despite, despite it. So yeah. I think that that's a, real, a really beautiful thing to consider when looking at this work. And I think it's that's why for me it's so meaningful that your engagement with it is temporal and it's ephemeral, right? Um, rather than building an abstract structure and putting it, yeah. you know, in the middle of a landscape, which artists have done also. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that observation, though. That that uh, it's not a part of the work that I get to to talk about much. Uh, it reminds me of a, um, a quote of, that uh, was said about uh, Kurt Vonnegut, that it's not easy to be easy to read. And I think that's a real goal of mine, it, to feel the kind of easy joy and levity and lightness in the work. but to know that there is something not easy, it, that there is a, there's a counterbalance to that. And, and I think what you, what, what you mentioned, that the environmental degradation station is exactly a counterbalance to the, to the, to the lightness of this work. Yeah. And I, I mean, the, there is a, we, we have this misguided tendency to assume that aesthetic strategies must follow the, the, the intent. So, you know, if something is about suffering, it must look like suffering or, um, and uh, God forbid, forbid. looks like this and is in fact a social political commentary. Um, so Benny, thank you so much. I'm such a great admirer of your work. I'm so happy to have gotten to know it and uh, to follow it from here on. Oh, thank you so much, Ksenia. I cherish our conversations and look forward to many more. Everybody go see the show. Uh, I, I don't know, do we have, uh, I haven't been following the chat, but we can open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Benny, and thank you, Ksenia. That was incredible and really, really insightful. Um,
we do have a few audience questions. And the first is from Kathy Lowry. I'm going to ask on Kathy's behalf. Kathy says, really love your paintings, Benny. How do you go about choosing the point in nature where your hand goes? Uh, that is sometimes a process of discovery, of going to places that I've never been before. And uh, if the weather allows, I'll make the painting in situ, you know, I'll, I'll walk around for a while and look for things that I find compelling and dynamic and sit and make a painting in direct response to something. And then sometimes I will have had the painting, I will make a painting under a shelter or indoors and then walk, walk out and find what I find. But then also, uh, once I have familiarity with the place, uh, I'll just form a little index in my mind of places that I want to go back to, hit them at different times of day according to where the sun is going to be and what the weather is doing, and what types of vegetation may or may not be blooming at the time or popping up. So it's a, it's a case by case basis for sure. The next question is from our friend GE. GE, I'm going to ask you to unmute here to ask your question. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Fessania. And so thank you, Benny. Um, question is, I, I find your chiastic uh, patterns to be the most amazing kind of virtuosity and stuff that's just so natural and quick and amazing and, um, and that seem a kind of simultaneously perform both these aesthetic and demonic functions. <clears throat> Do you ever do you ever find that as you compose and perform the pieces, because I think of them as both at the same time, which is this wonderful kind of vibrational thing, um, that that these pieces that you perhaps recall even deeper structures and patterns, kind of way of undoing our forgetfulness of our connections with these places and nature and all this stuff? Mm, beautiful. Yes. Uh, at the best of times. At the best of times. Uh, I can think on, especially a geologic scale becomes something that I can occasionally be sensitive to or, and feel like I might tap, be able to try to tap into. Um, uh, the gradations in the painting are also another way to suggest uh, the kind of constant movement of nature and of time and of scale, uh, the, gra the gradient is a kind of abiding principle that I try to incorporate into paintings very often. To set that color in perpetual motion is to uh, allow the all the did we lose Benny? I think we might have lost Ben. Oh, no. um, there we go. Benny, you're back. Oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'm not sure where it cut out, but I was uh, waxing about gradients there. <laughs> um, I also, I also saw that it is almost a, a direct kind of lineage and conversa conversation with what, some of the things that Smithson was doing, just working with the environment and finding that place and then, and then performing into it. So I love seeing even that, and whether or not, oh, not that's what you're doing or not, but it, that's what I seem to see. Yeah, his, uh, seeing his work was really f for foundational and, and life affirming and, and beautiful. I grew up in Idaho and uh, saw his uh, spiral jetty from the sky occasionally and travel down to Salt Lake and first saw it from, from the plane. And that, that work really just blew my head off the first time I saw it. I think I was a teenager and I didn't know that it was an artwork. I just didn't know if uh, it was an indigenous monument or somehow miraculously it was just there. It had that kind of incredible magic force to it. And, uh, and I would later go on to discover his, his writings are still some of the most um, kaleidoscopic, fractal, incredible, transformative writings about. And that geologic, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Oh, gee, thank you for your questions. I really appreciate it. 
And Benny, I'm going to ask the last question. Um, I really loved the part of your conversation with Ksenia about the hand as a powerful symbol of us and our impact on the environment. I would also say that the works have a hopefulness in them and a radicality in the way that they flatten the hand with nature itself on the same terms and kind of render them both permanent in one frame mm -hmm. um, and do that over and over again as an exercise, you know, and as a way of inserting this abstraction that you're taking all this time to paint that is dreams, that is ideas, that is color and kind of rendering it in the same terms in, in playful collaboration with nature. And I wonder, you know, what you've learned about nature through the repetition and through the sequence and kind of that process, you know, where it started and where it's come to over that time. Mm. Thank you for that question. Uh, I feel a sense of, I feel a, an enhanced sense of porousness in my own um, experience in that outdoor world that uh, having looked at it and kind of interacted with it or danced with it or just trying to imitate it, that it, it has helped dissolve some of the boundary between myself and nature. It's such a funny, like, nature with a capital N or a lowercase n, or are we it? Should we even make a distinction between us and nature? Can we even say the word without in inferring that we are it also? But it, but yeah, it, uh, an enhanced experience of boundary dissolution is probably the most exciting and dynamic um, uh, result of it. And uh, I think it's improved my memory also a little bit. It's like a mnemonic device, like the, the gesture and the repetition and the um, seeking something, seeking a little call and response between the landscape helps me remember it more. And so it just, uh, keeps the memory bank full of, uh, of sense memory. And, and uh, that's a real enhancement to my life that the work has made. <laughs> thank you for that question, it's a nice one. Thank you so much, Benny. And thank you, Ksenia. Um, and I encourage everyone here to see the exhibition which closes tomorrow, I believe. So, so there's still one more day. Oh, we did. Okay, so when's the new date, Benny? It got extended to August 6th, so um, a week from tomorrow. It's open till next Saturday. Amazing. So we have a week to go see these really beautiful works in person. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Well, at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Peter Brzezinski, to the stage. Peter Brzezinski earned a PhD in creative writing at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He works as the book center manager at Woodland Pattern Book Center in Milwaukee. Um, Brzezinski is the translator of Martina Bulizanska's This Is My Earth and the author of the chapbook A Year Alone Inside of Woodland Pattern. In between his studies, he has worked as a chef in New York City and Milwaukee. If everyone could please join me in welcoming Peter. Hi, buddy. Hi, Peter. Hi. I'm at work, but no one's around, so I'm going to take this mask off for the reading um, at Woodland Pattern Book Center. Welcome. Uh, thanks so much for having me. It's really wonderful to um, to be part of this event with the Brooklyn Rail and to be in the Brooklyn Rail and to share this artistic and human space with all of you wonderful people. Um, all right. Well, I suppose I should read some poems. Uh, oh, wait. Who speaks for the bones? 
I've spent so much time on the shovel. Sure, it's real, even grotesque, macabre. Have I wasted a minute on being wasted? Sure, but I've thrown pillows and ruffled folios, made fraud. Everything is foreign to me. Before, the score is when I lick my lips. I only salivate when I sleep. I should tell you something true, truly beautiful. A duck united with a pond, a flower reignited with its spawn. I'm not about April, I giggle genocide and break talons beaks tremble through november because i'm goddamned afraid of the dawn finished baloney grow more gophers are they necessary what is your newest necessity is it blue i know the way you've spent sorrow isn't enough to split lungs into doves flutter fortin breasts look at this look my head is wrapped in foil, aluminum, tin, twine around tungsten. It's hard to be your friend. I can't tell you all of my habits because you're no priest. Resist confession, admit oppression, you'd be wise. There are seven different accounts of Eastern European history. Please tell me which invader is quainter than the Reich. Bologna's plots unwise, Bologna plots graves, gravel over stone, stone over gravel. Is it mass or private? No plots, they took it away. We're full. How many borders will make us concise? The now cast. Rain. And then I made it a little darker than lovely. Two guitars, aroma song. One, Northern Indian Slavs know a song that is told somewhere along the banks of the Vistula as their waters spill into the Boog, eventually into the Dnieper, into Chernobyl and back. Two, there is a special brand of sadness that creeps in. It has the scent of cold rain cracking the sidewalks unparalleled parallels. A tiny Cossack defends his borders as ardently as his oppressors rename them. There are names like Kolya, Genya, Dima, and others like Varisha, Stasik, Stasha, I, Irena. Surzik cuts out our tongues like vodka cuts out our tongues, like it cuts blackberries down outside a train station overgrowth, somewhere that is not really anywhere but is a stop on the way to Smolensk. Three. There is a forest here, there is a forest there. You can find buttons amongst the birch peels. You can ask the trees in whom they believe. You can ask them the best ways to winter. The poppies run red and the music dies. If you turn your ear out on its left side, you can hear some patient words and avoid the worst. Hammock. Upon waking, you only thought of dying, how easy it could be. Whom would you most distress? And then I thought of the tree outside your window, how your heft would strip bark from its branches and so disorganize the leaves. Infrared and I ultraviolet to Psalm. I don't know how you could stand me anymore. I can't stand me. I've been panicking, truly panicking. I watched all of the new Cosmos TV series two nights in a row, and I thought I'd gain some perspective. I thought Neil deGrasse Tyson was right about just about everything humans should be doing. But today I woke up and panicked. I mulled around, panicked some more, took the bus to a big chain haircut place and told my barber I also didn't have a car anymore and that without my beard, I would feel naked and alone, just like in the reality show, but nothing like the reality show. I put on a hat and took the bus to a big chain everything store. I bought my Admiral Blue Medicine and panicked some more. I apologized to you for apologizing to you and you told me to get over it. I went back outside into the cold, still panicking. I waited for the bus again, made an orbit of brown down teeth. The bus pulled up in front of me a stoller whose 
stroller whose canopy had been snow and wind torn, now bulldog clipped together with a garbage bag at the facade of a frozen pizza box. A pair of teal mittens reached out. It was our child. No, not ours, but our collective child. It looked so blue, so red, so you, like us, but not dead. I stopped panicking. I don't know what in the tiny blue hell I was panicking for. Um, I think this is the two poem warning uh, or dialect. Wednesday, I just began listening to my body. I did not know it was talking because I am always talking. I talk too much. I talk too much and do too little. Please understand that I am a roulette wheel of anecdotes and nearsighted tambourines. I should listen to the crumbling gills in my body. I do not know anyone else who ignores the pancreatic flitter. I do not know what it means to die quickly. I should listen to my body. Okay, just kidding. There's, now it's two poems. Uh, thanks for your patience, and I hope, you're, uh, hope you're all have a good afternoon. Um, a merry decline. Dreams become rigid. Dialogues were replaced with tables and equations that no one could solve. Perhaps Deuteronomies or Decalogues. Everything was remade to be formal. A dance where none could think and all would fail constantly. The cha-cha of ungrateful hollow losing. It was nerves, I say. It might have been guts or aging or come to terms with limits, they said. Determined to deteriorate, I didn't like a bit of it. Each new day grinding towards a painful foreclosure, a resignation of thought. Is this my Mardi Gras of forever collapse? Resolve fled and the invisible claw marks of indifference clung to the staleness of breakfast hair, all farts and coffee as I remember it, lingering yet fresh like the cruelty of another dawn, still never enough fuel to be able to say onward. Um, and then I'll close with um, the poem that's uh, published in the Brooklyn Rail. And again, I'm very grateful to the magazine for having it. And, it broke my heart when I wrote it in March, and I, I was thinking about how many meanings there are um, for the word tongue. Like for me, I'm I'm a child of of Polish immigrants, and so tongue takes on many different meanings. But anyway, I, I won't explain too much. I'll just I'll read the poem. Um, talking about the, the war ongoing in Ukraine. Fields of flame. I'm tattered. The droops of my eyes fold clumsy over the crease of my powder blue mask like old paper waiting to die. I look to the east and the motors of history are ticking again. Humming brass coils flick with the electricity of dominance. Murder is murder, says murder. What neighbors are neighbors? A thousand years of brother shed, and ever since and ever after, our soils mineralized with the heavy iron of common blood. Somewhere caught between the seas, a sack of stolen potatoes spills out, and no one has the metal to pick them up. The sky blotted with a regiment of bundled flame. Soon it'll be time to plant beetroot again. The borscht we make are almost as similar as the tongues we use to slurp them. What will we harvest this year when all we've sown are bombs? Thanks, everyone. Wow, thank you so much, Peter. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much, Benny. And thank you, Ksenia. Um, today was really, really amazing and really appreciative of your time and, and conversation. Um, over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has brought together art, music, dance, film, theater, literature, and thoughtful social and political meditations in our monthly publication and in our public events, like here in our daily NSE. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support our writers, editors, and operations here at the Rail. 
And if you're free on Monday, please join us at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Brandon and Dife, hosted by Andrew Woolbright, on the occasion of Brandon's Outlooks Commission Shade Tree at Storm King Art Center. We'll conclude with a poetry reading by Miko Reveresa. You can now turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much. This was awesome. <laughs> Bye. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank 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 you. Congrats. Oh, thank you Go so much. Go see the show, everybody, please. Thank you, Raven. Thank you, Eleanor. Wonderful work, Benny. Thank Thanks you. for sharing. Thank you. Much love and congratulations. Much love. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye, everybody. Bye.